Hello, I'm Rick Sending. Today is June 17th, 2014 at the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers University. With us today for the Center on American Governor is Len Lieberman, who served on numerous boards and commissions, public, private, and philanthropic, through the terms of, as I counted, at least seven New Jersey governors and a few acting governors as well and today can offer us the benefit of a unique perspective on the administration of Governor Jim Florio. Len, welcome to Eagleton. Thank you. Um, let me begin by, by describing what happens if you do a Google search of Len Lieberman. There are citations from Forbes magazine, from several corporate websites, and from other sources that are decidedly conservative. Here is an excerpt from the background information from Bloomberg Business Week. Leonard Lieberman received a BA from Yale University, a JD from Columbia, and participated in the Advanced Management Program at Harvard Business School. He served as Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of Supermarkets General Corporation, one of the largest supermarket companies in the United States, and operator of Pathmark Supermarkets from 1983 to 1987 served as the chairman, president, and CEO of Outlet Communications, Inc., director of Enterprise News Media, Inc., director of Republic New York Corporation, director of Sonic Corporation, director of Michael Foods, Inc., director of Nice Pack Products, Inc., director of Celestial Seasonings, Inc., director of the William Carter Company, Modern Bank N.A., and La Petite Academy, Inc., manager of Consolidated Container Company, LLC, member of the management committee of Dean Foods Company, and a consultant to Vestar Capital Partners and its affiliates. Now that sounds like the resume of a conservative Republican, yet you are a progressive Democrat. Tell us a little bit about your background and upbringing and how this background feeds into who you are. Well, I, I, it had never occurred to me that that uh, that, th that those facts from my background uh, caused me to be labeled a Republican. Though Maravilli Dictu, I have, uh, to my amazement, received numerous solicitations from Republican candidates, notwithstanding the fact that uh, I gave a lot of money to a lot of Democrats in 2000 and 2004. Those Republicans probably read your resume on Bloomberg Business Week. <laughs> yeah, well, that's possible. The other, I, I, this, is, this is an irrelevancy perhaps, but, but there's a significant error in that. In, in that. Uh, they, they said I was a managing director, a <coughs> manager or something of Dean Foods. Uh, director, I believe. A director. Yeah. And uh, that was not true. It was just an, a mistake on their part, but it came up. It, it came to my attention when uh, uh, I was on the board of Modern Bank uh, in New York, and they became a, they were going to be a participant in a in a loan to see uh, to uh, Dean Foods, and as a matter of making sure that there was no conflict of interest, they ran my. My uh, my Google and they said, "Hey, your director Dean, we can't, you know, that that gets in the way of our." I said, "That's a mistake. I was not. I tried to extricate it unsuccessfully." <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that not an important. Thing. No, but that goes to show that you can't believe everything that you read on Google. I think uh, that's fair comment. <laughs> well, uh, but let me continue because sure. the second Google page that you get to for Len Lieberman points out that you're a founding trustee of NJ Pack, the Performing Arts Center right. in Newark. Chairman of the board of Newark Beth Israel Hospital, uh, established the Leonard Lieberman Family Foundation, are the chairman emeritus of the Fund for New Jersey, one of the state's most influential progressive philanthropies. So there begins to develop a, a, a broader picture of the, the Len Lieberman who is, who is well known around New Jersey. And on the third Google page, you are a campaign contributor to Democratic Senatorial and Congressional Campaign Committees, the New Jersey State Democratic Committee, the Lautenberg for Senate Committee, the Menendez for Senate Committee, Gabby Giffords, Emily's List, Democratic candidates and progressive causes, on and on and on. So let's wow. start at the beginning. Okay. Where did you grow up? 
How did you become interested politically? And tell us a little bit about okay. your background. I, I grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, uh, in uh, what I think one would properly classify as a lower middle class family living in a lower middle class neighborhood. Uh, uh, went to went through the Elizabeth public school system. Uh, my high school classmates were perceptive, and they voted me most likely to succeed. And I was very very pleased with pleased when some years later I realized uh, that I was I fulfilled their <laughs> their uh, their vote. Uh, I, I was, you know, a good student. Uh, was your family politically active in any not, way? Not in the slightest, not in the slightest. My, my, father, <coughs> my father was an immigrant from uh, uh, the Ukraine, in fact. Uh, and from, you know, he, was, he was a very hardworking guy, uh, struggling to make a living for himself and, and his family. Uh, I don't recall any politics whatsoever, except <coughs> excuse me, that when uh, during the 30s, uh, when the when the Hitler thing became open and open and notorious, uh, this was a very frightening time for for uh, uh, Jewish people uh, who. You know, it was just, it was, it was, it was a, they were being they were being labeled as a community of you know really bad people, and uh, therefore anti-Nazism was 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 the doctrine that we talked about. And then Franklin Roosevelt was God, and he was going to fix everything. That's how it felt. And indeed, by some process, I came to believe that. Every day and every way, the world was going to get better and better. Uh, it took me till my second year of college to realize what nonsense that was. <laughs> uh, I got very lucky. I uh, I aced my interview at, with a, a Yale alumnus. Uh, in those days, the uh, the uh, college boards, as we then called the SATs, uh, mandated that you needed to. To it, when you were sending your results to multiple places, you had to tell each place where they were on your preference scale. So the issue was, uh, in my mind, uh, shall I say? I mean, my memory is I was sending my results to Harvard, Michigan, Yale, and Rutgers. With all due respect, Rutgers was my fallback school, <laughs> that you were. and I, I hope, I hope. The institution will forgive me for that. <laughs> uh, and anyhow, I had this good interview, and I was driving home. And I said, "Okay, Yale was my first choice," and that that turned out to be, uh, you know, in fact, that's what happened, and it was a uh, it was a great experience. Uh, it was there, I think, that I was first I first began to pay attention to political issues. This was 1946. The bomb had, was just a year old. <clears throat> World federalism, which probably nobody remembers, was a very passionate movement uh, uh, led by, I don't remember the names anymore, but thoughtful people who had served in World War II and said, my God, this is, this is awful stuff. We've got to figure out a way to run the world uh, in, a, in a more organized way. So the, the, the World federalism is a very popular thing. Uh, interestingly, I, Yale was also the first place where I encountered uh, people who didn't agree with, with Franklin Roosevelt. One of my roommates was a, came from a, a family in, in Muskegon, Michigan, and he was a passionate uh, a Republican. Uh, you still refer to Roosevelt as that man in the that White man House. In the White House. <laughs> Uh, the, a, a very important person on the campus was a guy who became the editor of the Yale Daily News, a uh, fellow named William Frank Buckley, who got very famous later. Uh, and 
uh, uh, another uh, a local guy was was a columnist for the Yale Daily News named Don Wilson, who we all we all know we all know Susie. Uh, and I should, uh, it was very clear, by the way, the CIA was resident on campus, <coughs> and indeed, in my, in the Pearson College where I was living, uh, the, the CIA guy was, was a fellow. And, uh, well, Yale was a fertile recruiting ground for the CIA, yeah, the State was, Department. Yeah, uh, yeah, as was Princeton mm -hmm. and Harvard. I mean, the CIA got a lot of folks out of the, out of the Ivy League. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure that Wilmore Kendall, that was the name of the CIA guy, uh, before I had any sense of where, where he was, you know, what he was doing there, he and I sort of sat at a lunch table one day and I, <clears throat> I said the things that were, came easily to my mind. Like, organized labor was good, uh, Roosevelt was a great man, uh, you know, that, that kind of radical stuff, and I'm pretty sure that was enough to to, <laughs> to scratch you off the list of the, list. Of the <laughs> CIA recruits. Right. So you went to Columbia Law School instead. Yeah. Well, no. I, I, even that. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I was on my way to be a history professor. I had taken the graduate record exam. I had majored in history, uh, and but then I got I, I met and fell in love with and got engaged to and agreed to marry uh, in early and soon after graduation, and that that decision made me say I had to f find some alternative career because professing history was not about to be a a place where you could make enough money to, to support your family. At least that's what I then believed. It's probably it may still true. been true <laughs> yeah. in, the, in those days. Um, so I went to law school, and uh, uh, it was a great experience. Uh, I mean, Columbia was a prime place, and was at, you know at its peak in those days. I would say, no, I shouldn't say that, but it was at a peak, and I think it probably has continued to high. <clears throat> and um, came to New Jersey. Came, you know, came back to New Jersey. Uh, uh, clerked in Newark and uh, practiced with a law firm in Newark. That was not a political part of my life at all. Uh, I had I had uh, contemporaries who perhaps were more sophisticated than me, and they were out there. Working for the for the party and you know several a whole bunch of names we all we all would know guys who who went to Trenton in the minor administration a uh, uh, few of the you know, good friends of mine like Dave Satz uh, but that just was no I, I was just nowhere near that so was it your intention. Simply to practice law. I yes, mean, that, no, that I, was, was, I, I was focused on practicing law, and uh, I got you know this very at home. I've been a very lucky person. Let me let me put it in those terms. Uh, people came to see me. They wanted me to help them organize a a corporation. They were three operators of Shoprite stores, and they wanted to pool their resources and grow faster and. By some freak, my, I ended up as their candidate, as, as their lawyer. This had to do with the fact that my my father was in the wholesale food business. Ah, but, okay. So there is a connection now. Butter and eggs and that. Yeah. He was a he was an egg candler, to be clear about it. Um, so that yes, there is that connection. So I I became their lawyer and. Uh, uh, you know, he lied a lot of interval, intervening facts, but like in the Gilbert and Sullivan story, I polished up the handle on the big front door and became the, the CEO years later. Now how, how did that come about? I mean, you were a practicing attorney. You, okay. you, you now represented a supermarket uh, chain. 
Right. Uh, but how did this morph into becoming the CEO of well, a major supermarket? Well, the same chain. The, 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 uh, the guys running the business were very ambitious. Uh, I like to think, in retrospect, re recognized, like my high school classmates, recognized my, my latent capacities. Uh, and asked me to come in full time. I mean, they were, we were doing acquisitions and public offerings and that sort of stuff. Uh, it was a decision that, uh, I, uh, it was a decision they made, and I, and I did that. But you had no background in business at this point. Right? None whatsoever. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I, so I became their general counsel, uh, and it was a, it was a litigious period in the life of the supermarket industry uh, so that you know we needed a general <laughs> counsel um, and things 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 moved forward we did certain, you know several very constructive mergers constructed from our point of view uh, and uh, the CEO was a very thoughtful guy and he had heard of the Harvard Advanced Management Program Harvard Business School Advanced Management Program, and he, he urged me to do that, which I did in 1970. It was an interesting time to be on a, on a campus because you know, blood flowed in, <laughs> in Harvard Square, literally. Uh, uh, but I was oblivious to that as well. I mean, now I was focusing very hard, very hard on, the, uh, on the business stuff. And, you know, I, I could do this for hours on end, and there's no, there's no point. But I mean, I, that moved me. In the, when I came back to the company after after the 13 week program, uh, I would began doing more and more non legal things. I, I ran the real estate operation, which had a certain it was an easy jump, and then I ran uh, personnel. All you know, my por these were the portfolios I was oversetting. Mm -hmm. And then the most interesting one, I was, I ran data processing, uh, and this this was a period when scanning was being invented as a as a technology and being in, installed in stores, and we were we were pioneers in that very early. And uh, that was, as I think back on it, uh, installing. A, te a te technology that radical in a, what was historically a very simple business uh, was was, not, was was a very interesting and complicated thing to do, and I think perhaps was the I, I, I felt I felt reverberations of experience from that. The Performing Arts Center, for example, it was also a very complicated thing mm -hmm. in the years mm -hmm. later. Um, what, what was the Supermarkets general orbit. Who, how, how many companies were there in this, under this holding company, and what were some of them? Well, they were they, they were pathmark supermarkets. Is what we we started at Shoprite, and when uh, our ambitions exceeded Shoprite's willingness to to give us more franchises, uh, we concluded we had to leave, which in and of itself was quite a complicated thing. I should say. Uh, Shoprite was a franchise operation, uh, uh, and, it, and it was, as, as, it, as it were, a subsidiary of a retailer-owned wholesaler called Wakefern Food Corporation. Uh, so we decided we, we needed to leave. We invented the name Pathmark, uh, and over the years, uh, under our aegis, we, we acquired Brickle. Uh, home centers, uh, Girk's department store in Elizabeth, Steinbach's at Asbury Park at Plainfield, a bunch of stores in New England, the department stores in New England, a very good chain in Baltimore. Uh, we started gas stations, drug stores. So we had we had a bunch of businesses, uh, but the, the supermarkets were the core and mm -hmm. were by far the most successful. Part of our business, and over the years we were very successful. And by 1987, uh, when I retired, uh, I think we were the fifth biggest chain in the in the, in the country, mm -hmm. doing business 
some number like five or six billion dollars a year, which I remember with specificity because uh, you divide that by a number of weeks and you realize you're, s s you're selling a hundred million dollars of merchandise every week. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was right. And it was, I mean, for, for, you know, for, and in those days, that was real money. It was real money <laughs> and for little guys. <laughs> Uh, wow, how do we do this? Yeah, right? yeah. Now, um, there was a take. You, your, your, the company was, uh, was the target of a takeover, is that right? Yes. In 1987, <coughs> we were the target of a, of a bunch of takeover from some bad guys in Washington, D.C. We, uh, we avoided their grasp by doing a management-led uh, buyout. Uh, uh, which we, Merrill Lynch financed us, and you know we we, we took the company private. Um, I thought of that as a convenient time to step down. I had been working for whatever number of years it was, building, this, helping to build this business, and I knew that in a in a highly leveraged situation, it wasn't going to be as much fun. It was going to be more firing of people and more closing of facilities, <coughs> and I decided I didn't want to do that. Now, had you been at all active politically or civically well, leading up to okay, well, this time? So, so civically, uh, most, yes. <clears throat> and there were the political overtone, if you will. Uh, I was brought on the board of what was then, and I still, perhaps still is, uh, one of New Jersey's first, you know, first rank hospitals in Newark, Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. Uh, the, the chair was a man named Alan Sagner. Uh, Alan and I knew each other, but not well, but he spotted me, so he went, you know, brought me on the board, made me treasurer very quickly. Uh, and that was 1971. In, in 1973, in the summer, Alan called me and said, you know, you better get used to figuring out how you're going to run Beth Israel Hospital because I'm very involved in the in the burn campaign. I think I will I think we're gonna win and I think I will be offered a opportunity to, to be to go to Trenton and obviously then we're gonna need a successor and you're it. So uh, and then I, I remember on a, on a given day it, it probably was right after election day Alan called and said, okay, you know I'm, I'm going to be the transportation yeah, I mean, commissioner. Uh, I don't think yeah. he knew. He knew oh, he didn't he was know at going. that point what it I would be. I think he wanted Treasury, just to tell you the mm -hmm. truth. But can you imagine tangling with Leone? That would have been real interesting. <laughs> Dick Leone, who became the treasurer, yeah. and then Alan Sager exactly. became the transportation commissioner. Uh, and they worked together on the campaign, of course. But Alan was a very active fundraiser. For some reason, guys in the real estate business, which is what he was. Um, so that immediately pushed Did me. Did you contribute to the Byrne campaign? Not in any substantial way. I mean, yeah. a, a few hundred bucks, probably. Mm -hmm. um, but you're still not active politically now. Now you're going to become chair of the board of the Newark Beth Israel right. Hospital because right. Sagner's going to Trenton. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, now that this was a few years after Medicare had been, had been invented, uh, this is 1973. The uh, how to live with Medicare, how it, how it would impact the life of a hospital was, was being, we were mm -hmm. inventing it every day. It was also the beginning of hospital rate setting and That's the right. certificate of need program yeah, well, and all, all kinds of yeah, uh, interesting. All, all of that, you have a good memory. Uh, so it was, it was, an it, it industry was really being transformed uh, and, it was, and it was a, a very challenging and, you know, it, it really interesting activity. Newark, Beth Israel must have been going through some interesting adjustment at that time too to the to the fact that Newark has, had right. become a completely different community. Right, and uh, it was, it, you, you will of course remember that in, uh, let's see, we're talking 1973, uh, yeah, in 16, so 67. So six years after the Newark riots. Yeah, the riots. So Newark had changed. The, the mayor was now a black man named, named Gibson. You know, I'm not being, I missed something. I got recruited to work on the Gibson campaign, I forgot that, in 1970, by my dear friend Bob Curvin, who, who uh, I think, I, 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 well, I, 
he he was he was very involved in in Newark affairs. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a fascinatingly interesting man, and I could we could give you four hours. Also, on as I recall, one of the founders of what is now the Fund for New Jersey. No, that not so. Right? No, no, one of the er, one of the, one early, of the early members of the board of trustees. No, not no. that either. But one no. of the early beneficiaries. Uh, the, the the Fund for New Jersey was then called the Wallace Elgibar Fund. Right. And Gordon McGinnis was the executive director, and it, it had come. The old man had died in '69 or so, so it would just come into business in 1970-ish. That was Wallace. That was the that was the Carter Wallace uh, was, pharmaceutical. Yes. Uh, no, no, uh, it was uh, uh, Wallace and Tiernan. Uh, it was John Wallace was the, was the was the money, and the business was Wallace and Tiernan which was uh, in Belleville, I think, and, it, and I believe they had very significant breakthroughs in, uh, in uh, treating uh, dirty water and making it clean. Oh. Uh, so anyhow, uh, Bob, I, I, I never really pushed to find out exactly what the sequence of this was. Uh, Bob got, uh, in effect, a fellowship to Princeton uh, from from Wallace Elgibar. Now, I don't think it was a f full coverage, but it was enough to be you know, to make it possible for him. Uh, and I'm fascinated that you you remember it, albeit inaccurately. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I remember the name. I remember the name of Bob Kerbin coming up frequently in the early discussions right. about the, well, he, the fund. Well, he got his doctorate in 1974. Uh, it was one of the first students to go on the board of trustees I mean, uh, at Princeton, which was a fat, you know, sitting next to one of the Rockefellers, having, having been a, uh, as close to a revolutionary as you could be in the civil rights movement. I mean, he, was, he, was, he had a core in North, in North Jersey, and they, they, they did a lot of tough, constructive things. I mean, he's, he's a man who's, who's had a very interesting history. So he recruited you to to he, become to, involved in the Gibson campaign? Yeah, uh, and to help organize suburban support, which was we, we did a fair amount of. Mm -hmm. uh, Where were you living at the time? I was living in uh, Livingston. Uh -huh. And my then wife, up until that point, was a Republican uh, county committee woman serving next to Tom Kane on the <laughs> 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 But I divorced her several years later. She, well, then she had moved completely. Presumably not for that reason. Uh, no, but we had converted her. We had moved her to, she, she, was, a, she was a Democrat uh, by the time I left. <laughs> and Peter Shapiro put her into some, uh, some job. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that, there was that, that political thing happened. And that turned out to be of enormous use uh, in an unanticipated way, when I when I took over, when I was running Beth Israel Hospital, because we we had uh, zoning issues, we had uh, uh, you know we were in an expansionist mode, uh, we were you know, trying to build build garages. There was a variety of things in which my ability, fortuitous ability, to be able to call not Ken, but uh, there were some very able people. Uh, surrounding him at that point. Would Harold Hodes have been uh, I didn't know Harold, there, you know? but I think he was there. I mean, Richard Roper, who you probably know, was, was there. Jack Krauskopf, uh, perhaps a less familiar name. And then Kervin. I mean, when I, when I, and on one occasion, I needed desperately to get to see Ken because we were being uh, threatened by some uh, gangsters from, from Brooklyn who we were in the middle of a construction project, and they came over and they said, well, the, the classic thing, you, you need protection. Mm -hmm. You didn't know you needed protection, but I, you'd really need protection, and we'll, we'll do it for you, but it'll only cost you. And uh, I didn't know what to do. I went to see Ken, and I said, help. <laughs> These guys are trying to destroy our, our hospital. And Ken was very responsive, and he he sent one of his guys. Well, whatever. We, he helped. He helped. <laughs> Actually, I'd, I'd like to pursue that story, but we let's, okay, let's well, no, I'll, no, 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 it's I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm garrulous. I'll go as far as <laughs> he's paying for it. Right. Um, so that there, well, the 
the political connection was of great, great mm -hmm. uh, constructive use for the, for, 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 the, uh, uh, for the business. Well, and this brought you into contact with some people who clearly were going to become very active politically as, it, as the 70s and sure, 80s rolled sure. on. Well, even, I mean, here, here's a, gra a, a graphic play that happened that I do remember. Uh, there was a commissioner of consumer affairs, this is still under Byrne and Degnan, a, a fellow named, uh, probably, it's probably useful for me to forget his name, but uh, Levin. He was, he, was, he was the offspring of a very successful real estate guy. And so Levin was consumer affairs under John, or, or consumer affairs has always been in the Justice Department, mm -hmm. I think. And uh, consumer affairs, uh, Le Levin sent consumer affairs in, in, uh, weights and measures inspectors to one of our stores and to one of uh, Alan Bildner's King's supermarket. Oh, okay, we're back to we're back at uh, Supermarkets General. Now. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I'm doing. I'm no, okay, I'm no, doing no, that's fine. Uh, and uh, what Levin, Levin sent is in his inspector, and he and he sent him in, accompanied by a, a WOR reporter and cameraman, and he said, "I think I think that your your Pathmore brand butter is uh, underweight." So he grabbed. A hundred packages, unwrap them, and unfortunately, when you unwrap, uh, it's possible for some nuggets of butter to, to lead to. And suffice to say, he, out of a hundred, he found one, one or two that were, you know, fragmentarily underweight. Uh, and you know, this was he, he did it, and, and stood there and said, "Okay, you're guilty." And here was the TV camera. It was it was just grotesque. Uh, so and and something similar contemporaneously had happened with Alan Bilner and Kings. So Alan Bilner and I, who we, we neither of us had been terribly political, although Alan later on became much more so. Uh, we we went to see John Degnan, who was Attorney General. He was Attorney time. General. <clears throat> so this was in the second Byrne administration. I, yes. Well, yes. Uh, had to, yeah, it would have been the late 70s. Yeah. Uh, and uh, John Degnan had a hearing, and we told our story, and, and uh, Levin was just, I don't, I don't, it, wasn't, it wasn't a very articulate response. And I then, that, that taught me the, the power of uh, being able to call John Degnan, or earlier having called Kid Gibson, that, that was access, access, and important given the uh, the the ubiquity of pieces of government regulation impinging on the conduct of, of business. And it, this, of course, the Levin case, that was just bad stuff. So that was political, I would guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were a number of different things, entry yeah, points that you exactly had here and so. there, but nothing that made you a political activist. Uh, not at all. Okay. But also in that time frame, uh, by some process, I got recruited to be involved with, re with the Regional Plan Association. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, they had a New Jersey committee. In fact, I think they do. Uh, yeah. uh, again, but the New Jersey committee was led by Stanton and Bob Van Fossen of mutual benefit. Tom Stanton from uh, 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 a big uh, bank in Jersey City. Right. Uh, Van Fossen mutual benefit, which was a huge insurance company, but I can't find it now. Mm -hmm. uh, and regional plan was fun. And I, and I, I headed a few study committees for them, and then uh, along came the state planning commission. By now I'm in. Oh, I, I'm well into the Kane. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you are well into the Kane administration yeah, now. Yeah. Well, the Byrne administration ends in 1981. Um, right. Kane comes in. Kane comes in, and 
at some point where you're not appointed oh, yeah. to the, to the sure, public, no, no. public broadcasting. Exactly right? yeah. so. And indeed, that, that, was my, that was, for me, a very interesting phenomenon. John Degnan asked me to be supportive of him to run for governor. In 1981. In 1981. And he, he said, and by the way, what are you doing? I said, well, my hospital thing is over. Uh, you were out of Supermarket General oh, at this point. Oh, no, no, point. I'm sorry. Still in Supermarket General. Oh, well. But well, I that's right, of course. stepped down from the hospital. Right. Uh, actually, I stepped down from the hospital when the CEO of, of, of Pathmark died because that, that didn't push me immediately into the, it, made, it was clear to me I was going to have much broader responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So, um, So Degnan, okay. So, so to, to so Degnan says to me, "What are you doing?" I said, "Well, the hospital, not, the hospital thing is over. I really enjoyed that." He said, "I said, he, so he said, Would, are these other public service things?" I said, "I'd love to." And very deftly, I mean, it wasn't grotesque, but John said, "You know," he, he said, "In effect, if you support me, uh, I will, I will get you." something interesting to do. He didn't say that, but that was the, that was the unspoken uh, quid pro quo. And uh, so he then procured uh, an, an appointment f to the uh, public broadcasting thing, which required as a precondition that Gordon McGinnis come to interview me, which he did. So this was still this was still during the during the Byrne administration yes, at the very, the the very end of the Byrne administration because uh -huh. Byrne is the one who appointed me. I see. Um, so that you know that that was that was that one came sweeping in in I guess 1981. Steve Atabato was the chair of. Public Broadcasting. Steve Senior. Steve Senior. Pointed out. Gordon was the executive director. Uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the board was statutorily mandated to include the state treasurer and the attorney general and two other cabinet jobs. Uh, and by some process, I became vice, vice chair. Hmm. Uh, so Steve and I would drive, come down, come down together. Very interesting man. Still alive, but not, not, not active at all. Um, so this was your entree into, into the boards and commissions into, of yeah, the state of New Jersey. Exactly so. And a fairly important one. I mean, at that time, public broadcasting oh, was really I, becoming yeah, quite. No, uh, no, we were a big deal. Uh, Gordon was very skillful. We, we, it was it was a very interesting time. Um, however, when Kane became the president, the, the governor, uh, the word came down to us through the new state attorney general, who was one of a short guy, he became a judge later. Kimmelman, Irwin Kimmelman, Irwin Kimmelman, right? Who was a contemporary of mine. Mm -hmm. Uh, Erwin called Steve and said, uh, the governor wants uh, McGinnis out. And he wants Drix Neiman, whoever the hell that was. He in. had been the editor of New Jersey Monthly New Magazine. Jersey Monthly. Right. Uh, but we got to do a search. I mean, we can't just do it. We got to do a search. So we, so we did this. It was, this, it was a a charade search, but at the end, lo and behold, Drick's name was, was the choice. Uh, and I didn't like him, and I, I bailed out of, of, the, of, 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 the, of, of the job. Um, now, had you known Tom Kane from your time in Livingston? I, yes, I knew him uh, from Livingston, and more, more importantly, his, one of his older brothers was a good friend of mine. He'd been at law school with me, Hamilton, mm -hmm. Hamilton Fishcane. You really want all this? this yeah, is, this yeah, is, no, this is very interesting is because now, now, 
there, there are eight years of, of Tom Kane's administration, okay, during yeah. which you are still, you know, I mean, obviously moving up in the ranks, you're about to become CEO of Supermarket That's General, right. which you and were I'm, for most I'm, of his and administration. Tom appoints me to the Planning Commission. Right. And uh, Now, was that a statutory democratic position, or no, was it, that, it that was, was a, a statutory uh, citizen? Citizen. Uh, but I mean, I was I was a, a I was a two for one. I was a businessman, and I was from Hudson County. Right? We were living in, in Secaucus, so uh -huh. and I I had good credentials from the from the regional planning crowd. And although you had presumably given some money to John Degnan in his '81 campaign, you were not at that point labeled as a partisan Democrat. I don't. I probably not. Mm -hmm. Probably not. And indeed, the, my, my, in, the, my incumbent C serious girlfriend at the time uh, uh, was hired by some process. She, she worked, for, she was on the staff of T Tom's uh, chief of staff. What the hell was his name? Uh, Ed McGlynn. Ed McGlynn. Oh, yeah. Uh, not Ed. Uh, Rich. Rich. Rich McGlynn. Right, there were two McGlynns. Well, one of them was on the Public Utilities Commission. Yeah. I believe that was Rich McGlynn. That was Rich. Now, I, I don't recall which so was. So anyway, uh, <laughs> Rena was working for Ed, and uh, that, that while I broke, broke up with her somewhere during the season, <laughs> <laughs> that helped, I don't know what. Uh, um, but well, now you're on the State Planning Commission, and this is this is an area in which you you are clearly interested. You've been at the RPA yeah. and and it, yeah. on, on the New Jersey. And this Committee. was a, absolutely fascinating. And this is at the very very it's, early stages of the state planning. Oh, absolutely. Process. Yeah, we 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 were uh, Candy Ashman and, and I, Randy Primus was there in its capacity as. Uh, that would have been mayor. After, that would have been after. Florida, no, he, no, he was no. there in its capacity as mayor of Camden. Ah, right. There was okay. a statutory mandate for, for people, people uh, commission consisting of representatives with that, with that, uh, with, with that background. Uh, and there was, as I th said earlier, there were some, you know, the, uh, some of the women from the Kane administration who were mandated to be on it, like Hazel Luck and Feather O'Connor, and so they were really very, very uh, serious. Uh, Serious people. Uh, my, my memory is blurry of how long it took us to. We, we, we hired a good executive director, though I do not now remember his name. John Epling? You got it. Mm -hmm. You got it. Oh. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, and um, at, that, now that, at that point, because <coughs> that appointment coincided, I, I, I think. I was on my way to a, one of my first state planning commission meetings here in, in New Brunswick when my car phone rang and it was the people in my office saying, we are under hostile attack. I said, I ain't going to the planning commission meeting. <laughs> 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 I mean, the, the two played together. Mm -hmm. um, Once the hostile attack was over, in 87, and you I, essentially retired I, from Supermarket as, General. As we said in those days, I pulled my parachute. Uh -huh. um, now you started devoting considerably more time and attention to the yeah. State Planning Commission and to other, other civic and, and political and I, activities. And I got very, it was, I, th I saw, uh, what's his name, the guy who was then the uh, executive director of, of, of the Dodge Foundation. That would have been Scott McVeigh. Scott McVeigh. We were at a thing to, in Princeton together last Sunday. Uh, Rush Holt was getting an award from right. from Irene Goldman's crowd, and uh, and Scott was there. We hadn't seen each other in some time, and we were we we reminisced about the time, first time we met, which was at the organization meeting of the Partnership for New Jersey. Uh, Tom had sent a delegation of people to Minneapolis to find out how Minnesota did corporate relay fare so effectively. Mm -hmm. And Scott was among them, and they came back and led us into the organization of New Jersey. That evening, however, at the meeting, while Scott and I were talking over a drink, 
he was freshly back from uh, uh, Argent uh, from uh, Brazil, Brazil or Amazonia, but this guy was something of a scientist, I think. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, <coughs> were you in Manaus? He said, yes. I said, well, I was in Manaus a couple of years ago. And I sang in the opera house in Manaus. Oh, it was a beautiful little opera house. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody was in the audience. I just took advantage of the fact that I was, could walk up and <laughs> Well, that remark then produced a somewhat late, not too long later, Scott said to Bob Manfoss, and you ought to recruit this guy for for Symphony Hall, which was, which... <laughs> because you had sung in the yeah, now was, opera was house. A musically, a musically sophisticated, <laughs> interested businessman. Uh, Symphony Hall thing didn't go anywhere, but we, we, had, we had several meetings. Scott had, uh, Van, Van had been asked by Mayor James to tr you know, organize and try to make it something good happen. However, that morphed into the, uh, the Ray Chambers led uh, performing arts center thing. In which you became very active. I became very active. There were very few of us uh, uh, at the time, but, uh, but I was, I was a, a, a core person, and particularly when we, <coughs> after we'd hired Larry Goldman, whose name will come up again when we get to Florio. <laughs> Are we well, we're, we're almost we're almost there. We're okay. almost at Florida. Right. Right. You, so. you, if you guys are happy, <laughs> I'm enjoying myself. Right. Right. Keep going. Okay. Um, oh, after Larry, Larry was hired fairly early, and he and I had pure chance we were old friends going back to the Gibson election because he was a, Larry was then a, in graduate school at Woody Wilson and and. Kervin had recruited him as well, and we were, you know, we, we worked together on stuff there. You know, this is the living embodiment of how small a state New Jersey is. Yeah. We, 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 we come to that with so many of these interviews, of these interconnections yeah. of, of a relatively small group of people, all of whom end up knowing each other and being in positions yeah. of some responsibility and influence at some point of their lives. Well, you used to use a phrase, I remember, at, 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 at Center for Analysis, uh, Policy wonk. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> right. or something like that. Actually, um, there are far fewer of them than there are of these people that we're talking about now. <laughs> um, well, let's get to Florio. I okay. mean, we're 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 really at the point now where you you're on the you're on the state planning commission, actively involved there. The the performing arts center is beginning. It's beginning. To, there's there's some development right. of something happening there. Right. Um, you're you're still not necessarily identified as right. an active Democrat. Right. Uh, and, uh, Jim Florio comes in. Yeah. And, and what happens? Interestingly, um, let's see what happened. I retired in '87, and very quickly the Democratic machinery in the state. <coughs> I forget now who was the state chair. I think I think of the party. I think it was a, a, an operating engineer guy, I forget, an AFL so, I'm not sure. Uh, in any case, all of a sudden I get invited to, to be on one of the committees at the 1988, uh, not, not a delegate, but a, one of the committees at the 1988 Democratic Convention. 1980 would have been, I think. No, no, 88, yes, 88. Yeah, you're right, yeah. Come on. Man. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah I'm, um, <laughs> Yeah, eighty-eight, and that was uh, that was a, a sort of an interesting period. Uh, uh, there was no, there was no clear nominee coming down the pike. There was very strong uh, stuff coming out of uh, what's his name, the uh, uh, Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, I mean he was a candidate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, Indeed, All right, here, here, here's, a, here's a, a foot, uh, another political footnote. Uh, Lautenberg was running that year, and uh, mm -hmm. Kervin and I did a fundraiser at Kervin's home, fo you know, focused more on, on, on Newark people that, that he knew. 
and uh, this would have been Lautenberg's first re-election. He'd been elected I first in '82, so I he think, was running yeah, again I think in '88. So. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, the phone rang in the kitchen. Bob's Bob's son Frank answered the phone, <clears throat> and he came in. I don't think the meeting proper had started yet. We were just sort of milling around, and Frank comes in and says to Bob. Bill Bradley's on the phone, wants to talk to you. So Bob went to talk to Bill, and Bill, was, Bill wanted Bob's opinion on what position he, Bill Bradley, should take vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Jesse Jackson. Um, I don't now remember what, what <laughs> Bob must have given some very temporizing uh, advice, but it was sort of intriguing. There we were raising money for Frank. Uh, and then when I got to it, when I got to Atlanta, there, there was you know serious Jesse Jackson stuff. There was there were there sweaters and T-shirts and all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, and you were un you were a delegate. I was not a delegate, oh, okay. but I was. I, I forget. There had been a New Jersey primary, had there not? And. Um, it must have been in I, I have no, I just have, I have no memory. No, I, know, I don't recall. I know I was there. I was not a delegate, but I, I had some semi-official status. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, now, concretely, I, couldn't, I didn't have floor access, but for I'll have to remember who, who this was, but one of the, one of the other people on, on the New Jersey delegation who knew that I was interested in Bill Bradley. How he, I must have been interested in Bill Bradley right now. Uh, we, we cooked up the, the idea that we knew Bill was scheduled to speak in some capacity. Uh, and we made banners and stuff. Uh, senator for New Jersey, Senator, I don't know, good stuff. Uh, and I, I, therefore, I wanted to be on the floor the night Bill spoke, and uh, Randy Primus gave me his pass. <laughs> we, were, we were friends, but... <clears throat> um, and that was, that was the night that Bill Clinton spoke for about 14 hours. Right. Uh, uh, that's where I learned how to do this. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, okay, so now we, we successfully elect Jim Florio, and I, uh, I think, I would have to, my, here my memory is lousy. I think I was, until he came down with the executive order on, on, this, on financial disclosure, I think I was dreaming of becoming the chair of the Planning Commission. Uh, and I remember, I, I mean, I, I went to see Jim, they had transition offices on State Street. Uh, I went, and I went, I went, went to see Jim. Uh, ran into Cliff Goldman on the way in. I, I remember it was a, it was in an office building on State Street. Um, I do not now remember whether you had left on me, left me at, at Cappy by then. No. No, um, and I should point out for our audience and those who are reading this in transcript form that you, would, you were at that time on the board of the Center for Analysis of Public Issues. I was the president of the center at that right. point. I subsequently left, I believe it was either in late February or early March of 1990 to okay. join the Florio administration. Okay. Um, but this would have been, uh, the transition would have been before that. Before then, right. uh, I'm, what, what, I'm, what I'm fumbling with is I don't remember whether as I was thinking about that, whether I talked to you about it in your capacity. No, you would not a, have, no, you would not have talked to me in that capacity. <laughs> okay. In any case, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, as soon as he came down with the executive order, which was his first day in office, uh, I, I pulled the plug on that one. I yeah. This was an executive order requiring financial disclosure of all uh, volunteer members of the state uh, boards uh, and commissions. I think, yeah. And, um, well, I'll let you explain wh why why you you felt that this precluded you from continuing in that. Case. Yeah, well, I, I frankly didn't want to make that disclosure uh, uh, 
friend of mine and I who was in similarly situated named Tom Stanton, we, we both were, had, had recently had uh, you know, business transactions uh, and you know, neither of us wanted to start publishing our, our net worth. If my memory's right, that executive order called not merely for one publication, but I think it was, you had to maintain Tangle, it accurately yeah. each for each year. Uh, I'm, I had no clue as to whether anybody ever complied, because I don't remember ever hearing any more about it. Oh, they did comply. They I did comply. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. <laughs> because, but I never saw it in the newspaper, which, which is where I was afraid mine would have Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Florio did later on, as I understand it, um, recruit you for a task force on local partnerships yep. or something yep. of that sort. Yep. Well, uh, uh, he created, uh, under <coughs> the co-chairs were Randy Primus and me. The object was to see whether there were opportunities, uh, to, if you could persuade municipalities to share uh, police chiefs or, you know, that was always the big one because police chiefs make so much money. But uh, Randy Primus was at this point the commissioner he was of commissioner Consumer Community Affairs. Affairs. Community Affairs yeah. uh, and we had a lot of hearings uh, and learned a lot. And f at the end, there was a, a report printed, and it's on somebody's shelf. It's was this? I mean, did, was this the idea here to lead to municipal consolidations, or uh, let me remember, or joint partnerships? I uh, think uh, both, you know, uh, the, it was more direct. Uh, the, the 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 most concrete thing was: why can't you have a as South Orange and Maple would have a board of education that serves both towns, or, or why can't you have a municipal court that serves both towns? And there was, I believe, around that time, uh, there was an, an, an attempt to fold the two Princetons together. There, there, well, it was one of many. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's when I re came to recognize that the issues here were, were you know, kind, kind of unpleasant. I mean, I, I don't want to. I don't want my, my policeman to come from that town. I want my own, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I, I'm not, a, I mean, I, I do remember that there were several other communities in the state uh, where, the, where the similar proposals were going around. But our focus was mostly on the, why don't you would just, why don't we buy the same, use the same ambulance or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Now, because this was not a, statutory board or a commission, right. but a task force. Right. You could serve in this capacity right. without the, the financial disclosure issues uh, well, arising. I that... did, and I guess it was okay. Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, yeah, it must have been clear that it was okay. Now, um, Rick Wright, who was a, a, an assistant or deputy state treasurer um, in, a, in a, another of these interviews, right. Uh, mentioned that you had also become fairly actively involved in some of the economic development initiatives in that Camden, the Florida yeah. administration was involved in, particularly the Camden Aquarium. Right. Well, I was by then I was chair of the Cam uh, I was chair of the Camden Aquarium, appointed by, in effect, by Tom. The Feather O'Connor was the and Tom Kane. Tom Kane. Yeah. How had you come into that position? Uh, I think I, I think they were this the thing was just was just barely beginning to to be structured. This was, was the middle of eighty nine, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think I think the concept was let's get a North New Jer a northern New Jersey businessman to help us raise money. And, you know, and, and what have you. And I, my credentials were good. Feather knew me very well. Uh, she, she was the state treasurer. She was the state treasurer. And, administration. and, this, and, and uh, this, this, this whole aquarium thing was sort of under her jurisdiction. The aquarium was being built, it was being built by the, by the sports authority. Uh, they, they had the facilities to organize the construction. It was being, uh, it was the, the, the what, what, what kind of aquarium to do and all that stuff was being, we had an advisory relationship with the Philadelphia Zoo. Uh, and 
Why did Tom appoint me? Well, I don't know. Well, you've you answered that. I mean, a, a North Jersey business man yeah. could help him raise money. And, uh, but, it be, but during the Florio administration, it, evidently, the construction and completion of this project became quite complicated. Oh, absolutely. No, but let me, let me, let me stay, stay chained for, for a while, for a moment. Um, Florio had deputized uh, Rick Wright to, to, to be his, his Camden, the Camden development person. Rick at that point was one of two deputy treasurers, I think. Uh, he and Nate Skrivonik and the treasurer was Doug Berman. Mm -hmm. uh, I had not, that's, Rick and I had not known each other. Uh, we fell in love the first time, the first time we met. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was really very pleasant. And we ended up negotiating the the lease between the state and the and the aquarium. Um, Rick credits you with having come up with the decision to name the aquarium after Governor Kane, and that that, that was a critical component of helping to pull right. everything together. No, that was true. And, uh, uh, what, I, what, I, what I saw, what I foresaw, was that we were going to need, continue to need nourishment from the state of New Jersey at the, at the aquarium, and that the Republican majority in the legislature uh, would need to be dealt with. This was after the midterm election in which the Republicans had swept into office, or to, uh, to both houses of the legislature. Sure. Well, it must uh, have been, because the Democrats uh, had been in control of the legislature yeah, before well, the midterm. I, Maybe I was just covering my bases because because I I do think this happened pretty early, pretty early be, before the midterm elections. Mm. So I had the idea and I I, uh, I I went to see Salima, who was the chief of staff at the time. I must have talked to Jim briefly, but I don't I have I can't frankly remember that. Uh, Salima came back with it came back with an affirmative answer, great idea. And then, uh, in order to make it happen, we had to go to make sure Kane wanted to do it. Well, how, you, how did we talk to Kane? Well, we, we were told that Sam Crane, who was sort of the Kane, Sam was then was by then. Uh, uh, He, 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 was the, he was the treasurer by then. I don't... So I'm, not, I'm, you know, just, I'm getting confused. Yeah, he, he, had, been, he had been on the, on the uh, financial side of, of the legislature and then yeah. moved over to the administration right. in, in Florio's administration. He, he subsequently became, he became treasurer, state treasurer, but he wouldn't have been... Maybe president. he wasn't then, but, but he was... But he was and certainly in treasury at that and point. He, and he knew the Republicans. Mm -hmm. So to persuade Tom, or to offer it to Tom, the way we did it was to go see Tony Chicatello, who was, who was, I, I, that was a new, that was a name I didn't know at the time, and uh, he asked some appropriate questions, uh, and he, he they get they get back to us and said, yeah, Tom will do it. So I was very proud. I thought that was, I mean, I, I thought I had, per, perpet, had, had secured the financial future of the aquarium in perpetuity. Little did I know that uh, <laughs> Mrs. Whitman, uh, when when the need arose, would take Tom's name off as quickly as she took Brendan's name off the <laughs> arena. It was funny, um, but for a period of time, it was it was known as the, you know, the, the Tom Thomas full name. I forget Thomas Hamilton Kane. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, New Jersey State Aquarium. Mm -hmm. Now tell us about the Performing Arts Center and how that was all moving okay. along, because okay. that, that too was in yeah, the process. Yeah, very much. That was almost happening contemporaneously, mm -hmm. because uh, it really, the relationship that Rick and I created between us uh, in, these, in these Camden issues, uh, you know, made us, made us logical uh, you know, people to be working uh, on the for the Performing Arts Center now. Performing Arts Center situation was the following. Uh, we had received support from the Kane administration in the form of uh, 
So the, the EDA sold bonds and spent, uh, at our, with our oversight, I think it was about 40 million bucks to buy the land that uh, we had by then uh, decided was, was, was the right place to be in Newark. And that, was, that, was, that in and of itself was a very yeah, interesting. I remember that, that just deciding on the location took yeah. uh, considerable time. Well, by then, it, by then it was clearly going to be Newark. Which I mean, early on, it was Morristown and other places were contending, but in Newark, uh, there, there were other. There was a, a serious set of arguments that said, "Well, do it the other end of Broad Street, down where Symphony Hall is, refurbish Symphony Hall, and use that as as the core." And uh, I don't now remember. I mean, we we we, we had consultants come in. Uh, we actually had we actually had support from uh, what's his name the guy who who developed much of Baltimore and the Rouse 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 yeah Ed, Rouse came to town and he he looked at the river and he said you got to be next to the river <laughs> that that's where you should be and uh, that also was a, not coincidentally close to the train station which yeah, became well, a, a decisive factor right. as well. Uh, and you know, and from there forward, that, that was just a matter of figuring out which chunks of land, mm -hmm. uh, or, or which land near there. But once the, the the location was decided, that was just the beginning of the oh yeah the, the now, activity. Uh, we had uh, <coughs> we we were actively seeking p private money. Uh, uh, actually, before the state gave the let's go forward signal, which was back in the Cain administration, they wanted to be sure that money should be raised by the private sector. And Ray Chambers and Bob Van Fossen, who still was, I mean, mutual benefit was still alive in those days, they each, uh, it was announced they had each signed uh, uh, letters of credit or you know, something of the sort for big, big bucks. And that was enough to move the thing forward. That, that's, what, that's what made it comfortable for the Kane people to, to do the EDA money. At least that's how we understood it. Now, fascinating little footnote, those, those letters of credit never could be found. And, <laughs> and were never used. <laughs> but their, their asserted existence was a I mean, I never wanted to go too far into that. But that, but that was the basis for, for that this, got the ball rolling. In terms yeah, of in money the, it, it, it was an expression by, by the private sector, as it were, that money could be there. And, you know, early on, Ray, who was, who was brilliant at this, Chambers, uh, he had uh, gotten Pai Chubb involved, Roy, Roy, Roy Vagelos, who was then running Merck involved, uh, Prudential, uh, the phone company, PSENG. By then, by the way, the number of, of Newark players had diminished. You know, there were a lot of bank mergers and disappearances. But uh, so, and, and, and we had a board in being, and, me, and these, many of these institutions were represented. Oh, I left that AT and T, which is the, the Maury Tannenbaum of AT and T was incredibly useful in that project. Okay, so now we're at the end of, we're, we're uh, in comes, in comes uh, uh, Florio. Uh, we, we need to know where our next glob of public money is coming from. Uh, Florio, the Florio administration in the first, in, in its first communications took more of the form of, who needs this? We don't need this. They, you know, it was, they were not jumping up and down, uh, and I think that had to. I think that had to do with the fact that that uh, Jim Jim still had a lot of South Jersey connections, and and this is probably uh, I'm, I'm making this up. I don't know for sure, but it was probably an early version of the. Uh, why does North Jersey get everything? Why does South Jersey get some? That kind of thing. But in any case, uh, 
uh, it was very, it was, it was so, we were, this, the attempts led by Larry Goldman, our, our executive director, uh, to, to make progress were, were, it was very difficult. And that's, that's a point, that's an, a time, I think, when Rex and my uh, successful working together on, you know, on issues in Camden, I mean, we were on a, you know, collaborative basis, and, and uh, by some process, the Florida administration became supportive. I mean, it was, uh, and I don't know for sure. I mean, obviously, nothing happened there without Jim say so, right. and uh, conversations I've had over the years since with, with Rick and Doug Berman and so forth, uh, um, made clear to me that. Uh, uh, Floria would listen to the proposals and would say, okay, we'll be able to do it, and you don't have to come back to me for details, I'm with you all the way. And, and you know, and that, that, that's how it played. You think that he came in um, unenthusiastic, I wouldn't say reluctant, but unenthusiastic about the Performing Arts Center, I'm, and yes. over a period of time, the arguments for it convinced him I, to say, go ahead? Exactly so. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the big, the, the, there was, a story of uh, uh, Sharp James had taken Mayor, uh, Governor Florio to a concert in New York City, and Sharp said, <laughs> he fell asleep. He didn't care about music. <laughs> 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 Anyhow, I don't know that that was true, but I know that Sharp said it. Um, had you, at this point, developed any kind of a personal relationship with Jim Florio? With Jim? Uh, not really, I would, I would say. I mean, we we uh, uh, we, we you know it, it certainly certainly the, the the key connection was 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 Rick in that in that in that period, um, uh, and you know every interaction that Jim and I had was 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 very affirmative, and uh, he felt that Randy and I. Had, can't, I can't really date this, but it, the project that Randy and I were in, uh, we produced a marvelous report, which must be on some <laughs> shelf here somewhere. I have a copy of them. Um, well, the, the whole conversation about not just municipal consolidation, but municipal yeah, and, it, and school board sharing of services oh, it's data has, has certainly become very current. Yeah, yeah it, it took a while. and. Uh, I mean, it, what, it, 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 what it exposed me to most powerfully was, was recognizing uh, that home rule also meant my neighborhood home rule. I mean, the, when I began hearing the stories about the animus between the, uh, the I think it was the, the people living in the thing, in, in the Princeton that surrounded them, they didn't want it, they didn't want the deal with the downtown people, that there must have been some, I don't know, whatever the hell was going on. <laughs> and that, that, that happened again, to my knowledge, in Freehold, well, whatever. And that well, was all it. the hole in the donut communities, I think, at some yeah. point have discussed this, and only the Princetons have actually right. taken the action and, and, of and merging. This was, this, I had had an earlier piece of lesson in this direction. Uh, on the State Planning Commission, we had, we had hearings around the state. And I, I, I was, I, I think I might have been chairing this, the hearing in, uh, I don't know whether it was Cinnamon Center, you know, one of the mm -hmm. towns south of Camden, in which somebody stood up and said, uh, you know, we, we don't want you guys to tell us how to run this thing. Uh, and uh, we don't want you to tell us who has to live with us and who has to come into our community. So I think this was a little after the, the exclusionary zoning litigation. Well, that, and, and in fact, it, I mean, it needs to be pointed out that the that the Mount Laurel ruling is what gave rise to the State Planning Act. Yeah, right. That that it, it required the, the the Supreme Court said that there has to be right. affordable housing in growth areas, and right. there was nothing in the that the state had that indicated what was or was not a growth area, right. and that led to the past of the you're, State Planning Act. You're, so. you're absolutely right, of course. Uh, I'm particularly proud of that one, by the way, because the Fund for New Jersey had financed the, the early exclusionary zoning cases. Uh, 
and uh, as we also financed, had financed the uh, the uh, educational funding mm -hmm. cases. I mean, this is well. You now you okay? Let's morph into this because you've you've become sort of a passionate uh, supporter of of these kinds of initiatives. Yes, I have. And, and but I, you weren't at the time. I mean, you weren't actively involved in them at the time. Right. Is, are these? I think a lot. Of, I, I, I think. Uh, I think an accurate answer to that, to explain to that, has to do with the power of my relationship with Bob Kirvin. Uh, he and I had become brothers for all practical purposes, very quickly. Uh, we, we each brought things to the relationship that the other could use. And for me, it was, uh, I mean, I didn't know stuff, about, I didn't know much about, nor, I thought, I thought there was, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say this, it, it was as, as late as 1960, 70. I thought that the things were bad for black people in the South, but were marvelous in the North. I mean, I'm embarrassed to say, that's how stupid I was. Well, I learned a lot from Bob pretty, pretty mm -hmm. quickly. And we have stayed, you know, very, very close since. Mm -hmm. So I think it was, in, a lot of it was my in, interaction with him, Gus Henningberg was a, was around then, and he and I would, would do, do a lot of things together. Uh, and these were men of passion and, and, and intelligence, and uh, the, the, the fog fell from my, from my <laughs> eyes or something. You had earlier mentioned Don Wilson as a classmate at, uh, or yeah, an acquaintance he, at that, Yale. That, was, uh, that had no, no significance for me. I mean, Don did come on to the Center for Analysis Board. And then, and and then was, he, 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 was it he who, as I recall, Got you involved um, at, at the center? Oh no, no, that was no? that was Dick Leon. Oh, it was Leon. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean by then, oh no, that was be it was before we had the fight, <laughs> uh, and that that came about through Alan Sagner. Right? I mean, I see. Uh, uh, Alan Sagner, you know, bragged about me to Dick, and uh, Dick took Alan very seriously. And of course, you already knew Gordon McInnes from the from, from the, the uh, uh, public broadcasting right, uh, right. situation, so. And this was the group of people, it should be pointed out, Leon and McGinnis and Cliff Goldman, uh, I think, who had founded the Center for Analysis of Publications. I think that's right. Um, that's and then 20 years later, uh, brought you on board. And, and, I, and I was, that must have been your first nonprofit board of... Uh, uh, no, well, I, the, the hospital had preceded I, I see, but, I, but in, uh, that was that was actively involved in, 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 in politics, politics yeah, and, yeah. And, and public policy. Yes, I think that, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. You, you subsequently chaired the board of the, of the uh, oh, Center for oh, Analysis yes. of Public Issues. And then uh, somebody told me I had only a two-year term. I didn't care. It, I didn't seemed, it seemed longer, I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, and there, I, there my, one of my accomplishments was to bring Tom Stanton on the board and Alan Bildner's son, Rob, who uh, is still around. And there I was saying to myself, okay, we got now the financial, financial future of this organization is secure because we got these rich guys on. That <laughs> uh, may or may not, or I don't think, it, I don't know what finally happened. It, 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 it it's irrational. probably back. not a story worth telling here. Yeah. Um, the, when did you get on the board, when did you go on the board of the Fund for New Jersey? Uh, soon after I retired, so it was probably 87, 88, uh, uh, Joe Cornwall, who was the pater familias, a marvelous human being, he came to see me out of nowhere. I didn't know him. I knew very little about the fund, uh, but I guess I, 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 the guy who was the executive director then, uh, Robert Corman, Corman I, had, I had vaguely known. Uh, and Joe invited me on, and oh. exactly, uh, it isn't clear to me, I, I'm reasonably sure that he, he was, I was touted to him by John Gibbons, whom I had known as a young, we, we were young lawyers together, John's a few years older, and conceivably Gus Henningberg at the time. Uh, and uh, as I said in my book, 
<laughs> which the world would never read. <laughs> which is available on Amazon. Amazon. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> totally unknown to you. Uh, no, literally, this is, a, <laughs> this is fascinating. Uh, particularly because I'm, uh, I'm just buying a bunch of Amazon books from Amazon, but Bob Curvin's book is just, is just yeah. coming out. Well, well, you can buy your own, too. Yeah, yeah. buy them up and burn them. <laughs> um, when I became chair of the fund, which was when Richard, around the time Richard Sullivan retired, I can't date this with specificity, but it's maybe, 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 maybe I'm, Google. I'm sure, I'm sure we could look it up on Google. Uh, and um, I, ha I mean, I, I say this candidly uh, for a Jewish boy from Elizabeth, from a lower middle class family to be invited to be the chair of, of that entity. Uh, the seat I was occupying, I, I, I replaced Robert Goheen, he went off the board. And then we didn't serve simultaneously, but and it was just uh, it, John Gibbons, uh, Dick Devois, uh, an extraordinary man from AT&T named Bill Baker, whenever, mm -hmm. whether any of you ever it was a pretty remarkable crowd of people, and I thought to myself, and I, I, enough so that I said it in my in my book, this was this was it. I had I had made it. You, know, you succeeded the former president of Princeton University in that uh, position. So yeah, well, not in the chair, some, not in the no, chair, no, but as yeah. but on the board, uh, and, the, and who also happened to then by then I think be the father-in-law of the incumbent executive director. I mean, with Mark Murphy, <laughs> right. I mean, that, was, that was weird. But, um, but I mean, I felt more than I had ever consciously thought about before, uh, i.e., you're, you're not a member of the in crowd. Mm -hmm. that, that event, uh, it resonates to this day. Well, this is this this in crowd that you speak of is is the is the pro, is the progressive yes, in crowd exactly of, so. of, of in, in New Jersey, so to speak. And in that capacity, you've also gotten to know Jim Florio, who's exactly. now a member of the board. I think in a way that you certainly didn't know him before. Well, that's no. It, 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 let, let me flesh that one out. I, I brought Jim onto the Fund for New Jersey board. Uh, I. I felt very guilty uh, in the year 2000 or 1999 when I devoted all of my political energy and strength to the uh, to the Bradley campaign. I was on Rick's finance, Rick was finance chair, Rick Wright. This was Bradley's presidential run. Presidential, yes. And simultaneously, Jim Flory was running against John Corzine for for the Senate. For Senate. Mm -hmm. And I felt guilty as hell at, 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 at leaving, at having left John, having uh, left Jim unsupported in that election. I probably wrote a check, but I mean. So I really sought him out afterwards, and, and you know, and we, we, we moved into a very, a very pleasant and constructive social relationship, uh, which Rick was a key player in, in as well. Uh, and uh, there was a period when, uh, under Rick's aegis, he discovered that the, his birthday, my birthday, and Cliff Goldman's birthday were within a few days of one another. We, we had a series of the annual birthday parties in, in, with the Cliff Goldmans, the Rick Wrights, the Len Lieberins, the Jim Florios, and the Dick Leones, and those interesting birthdays, birthday parties. I'll <laughs> bet they were. <laughs> Because uh, historically, there had apparently, I didn't, I never saw any evidence of this, but Jim, Jim Florio and Dick Leone were not the closest of friends. Though I don't know what the background of that was. Uh, their, their temperaments are well. It, yeah. it would be interesting to discuss the different temperaments you know. of those two. Uh, so anyhow, uh, I, I brought Jim on the phone from New Jersey board. Uh, Earlier, uh, even before that, he had said to me, you know, I'm really interested in health care. And, and I said, I got just the board for you. I've, this has not come up in our conversation so far. I had been, 
I had been on uh, a board called the Center for Healthcare Strategies, which was a spin-off of RWJ, mm -hmm. uh, run by a very able fellow named Steve Summers. I was one of those organizing uh, trustees. And we were studying the intricacies of Medicaid and managed care and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I said to Jim, I got just the board for you. And I, I, I got him on that, which he, he, he certainly enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And it was nice to be able to do something of that, you know, use my influence on his behalf instead of the other way. You used the expression policy wonk earlier in the conversation. Right. Um, would you describe Florio in that way? I think Jim Florio is the smartest policy person, the most knowledgeable policy person I've ever met. Uh, I, I mean, we've, we've, we've had a lot of conversations about a lot of subjects over the years, and I have, he has bedazzled me. Uh, Particularly because you know I, I I know I know the history is such the poor guy didn't even graduate high school I mean you know he's a one of the most self-made self-built people and he just did an incredible job building himself I think. Now, there are some observers who who have, who have suggested that because he is such a policy wonk he was very well suited to be a congressman and not especially well suited to be governor would you agree with that assessment? Uh, I, well, I, th I think I think it's so clear, at least from my, uh, from my perspective, that uh, that he screwed up as governor in 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 getting the priorities straight. I mean, he never, in my view, never should have done the the uh, the automatic weapons thing uh, first because he did he did that one created uh, active enemies of the NRA and they. They had nothing better to do than come back and kill, and, you know, and be bad, bad boys on the tax thing. I mean, uh, my 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 practical view was I don't, no, I don't re recollect that anybody ever asked my opinion. I mean, Doug Doug Berman knew all of that. He knew all about this stuff. He was the smartest political person in the world. Uh, he said, and. Uh, I think they just made a huge mistake. In the, they, they, I think they should have waited until the Supreme Court opinion came down, uh, which would have been a little later in the first, the first year, uh, and it, it was probably would have before before proposing the tax. Yeah, because uh, uh, I think the Supreme Court opinion would have mandated it, mm -hmm. uh, and it, and in fact it did. It, yeah, but but by then he had hung himself out out mm -hmm. there. I mean, I, I, I do you think I mean, do you think that's a nuance that I mean, most people don't remember that that the Florio tax plan predated by a few weeks the Supreme Court decision right. as opposed to it being a reaction to the Supreme yeah. Court decision. Do you really think that that's a nuance that would have made a difference in terms of yes, you do I do because I, I remember uh, under Brendan uh, the the by then Hughes was chief justice. The, the the court came out with an opinion that uh, I think, in effect, said you can't open the schools unless you. Well, oh, they did in fact close the schools. Yeah, it required the schools right, to be right. closed. Of course, so it was July first, so none of the schools were right. open anyway. But the no, but the, <laughs> so that the precedent of that, uh, one could have forecasted that something like that would highly likely come again. Uh, and uh, so I don't know. I mean, it's one of these questions you, one would never know the answer to. And I, I, I've come close to pushing Jim on it, and then I decided if I'm, you know, if I'm right, uh, I'm not. Gonna, there's no, no point in rubbing his nose in it. And in the interval, they get, he got the profiles and courage thing for doing that thing. So I, well, mostly for the assault weapon, as, as much for the assault weapons ban, I think, as the uh, uh, you're probably as the right. tax. Uh, Probably right. So, so it's, the assault <laughs> weapons thing was nowhere near as as uh, as uh, I mean, a lot of states had it. Well, and it was overwhelmingly politically yeah, popular yeah, in New yeah. Jersey. In fact, it was one of the only elements of, of, of the early uh, activities that wasn't subsequently overturned by the Republican right. legislature. So, well, look, this is all your fault. You were sitting there in the policy <laughs> office, and you must have had something to do oh. with sequencing the. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you didn't how, have... how I wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, um, and th this is a question that we've, you know, that has been put to to Jim Florio yeah. on any number of occasions, and and obviously it was a, 
it was a it was a series of difficult choices. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, How did you feel at the time? I mean, you were you. Um, I don't think I paid that much attention to it. Okay. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say. I mean, I'm, it's much easier in retrospect. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's see. It's interesting to me that that most of the people whom we've interviewed for not only for this for the Florio uh, archive, but for most of the other gubernatorial archives, are people who sort of became actively involved politically at a fairly early age and moved into an administration um, with political activism in, in their background. You're coming at it almost from exactly the opposite point of view, and that's the reason that I think the perspective is so interesting. I guess that's so. And, uh, uh, well, you, uh, I mean, I, I have... I have not surveyed your interviewees, but uh, uh, I mean, at this point, uh, it's the rare day that I don't talk some public policy issue with <laughs> Bob Kerman or Tommy Byrne or uh, Rick. Uh, though I have to, I have to confess, I am, I have pulled in my horns very substantially. I mean, I've. I'm now living with the Debbie Ports, and it's all a waste of time. <laughs> uh, you need to elaborate on this, what you just said, oh. uh, because Debbie, uh, <laughs> oh, okay. the, the, the former Chief Justice might might need you to explain oh, okay. exactly what, oh, you're, well, what well, you I mean. mean. Yeah. By the way, she was a recruit for the, I got her in the Fund for New Jersey. A fellow Jersey. member of the Board of New yeah. Fund for New Jersey. No, Debbie once said to me that uh, she get to be our age, and she was gracious enough, I mean, she, she just turned 70 the moment I recruited her, and I'm 85, but I was flattered that she bracketed herself with me. Uh, if, if people are our age, if, if, if you're not a pessimist, you haven't been paying attention. Uh, and at this point, uh, uh, I, I have you know, very substantially pulled myself back from, from Political activity. You are the chair emeritus of the fund for New Jersey at this point. Yeah, but I, but I, do you still you still attend meetings oh, yes, and are absolutely. actively involved in their activities? No, I, I mean there I that that the timing of that, if you if you may you might be interested, was was animated in my mind by the simultaneity of the fact that the um, the the Obama transition was going on at the same time. And it was clear to me that the Obama transition folks were you know, very seriously taking into account, you know, what's likely to come down the, the pike soon and we got to prepare for that. Uh, at that point in time, Mark Murphy had, had given his, his, his proposed to resign in an indeterminate time as the executive director. As the executive the director. Mm -hmm. And in addition to which, it was clear to me that that the uh, we were get, we were, we lost money in the sixty eight in the in the depression. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, so that our capacity for we were going to have to revisit our, our, our donative policies. And uh, I so, thought to myself that uh, it was an important for the, my successors, whoever they were going to be, to be very much involved in the recruitment of the executive director, because they were going to have to live with them. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and I was, you know, we were blessed. I had uh, Gary Rose, who's an you know, incredible guy, and Larry Lussberg, both you know, willing to take it on. And uh, but the thing that impelled me time-wise was, okay, before before we hire the executive director, before we you know, before we revise our donative policies, you guys should be here. Um, but I say no. They, they they begged me to stay and share my wisdom, and I I do that <laughs> happily. Really done that. Uh, and uh, it, you know, that that whole thing is one of the great, as I indicated before, one of the great parts of my life. Just um, to, to follow up on the period of time after the Florio administration, mm -hmm. Whitman, McGreevy, Corzine, were you act all actively involved on any boards or yes. commissions well, no, during I those periods? No, nothing with Whitman, nothing with, nothing with McGreevy, uh, 
but uh, it was a CWA late, lady lawyer, uh, leader. Chris had a girlfriend. Carla Katz. And Carla Katz, thank you. Right. Voice from the. From the <laughs> Carla <laughs> Katz, uh, whom I don't think I knew, she called me one day and she said, John and I would like to, <laughs> to have you and, and Arlene, my wife, uh, join us for dinner. Uh, so I thought that was nice. Was he governor at this point, or senator? No, no. I, he he must have been. He, he was not governor. No. Was, uh, so I guess no. He was he was he was senator, and perhaps he was about to be named uh, chairman of the senatorial campaign committee. Mm -hmm. uh, this was before that. That he either maybe just about the same moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, went out, we went out to dinner, and at dinner, as well as, as, as much as, in addition to Carla and, and John, uh, uh, John's chief honcho, his, his lawyer, I hope somebody here remembers her name. Uh, uh, Is it Zelina Farber? Uh, no, 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 no. no. Oh, shoot. It'll come back. Okay. <laughs> uh, she and her husband were there. Her husband was a painter. Her husband painted the marvelous portrait of John Corzine that, that the state has now. I don't know. We're both. We're we're all blanking on this one. Um, <laughs> I'm blanking on her name. But anyway, she was there uh, with her husband. Uh, I think Clive Thomas and his wife Anne were there, uh, and. At that point, uh, John's, John's had, a, had an office in, in my office building upstairs from where I am, where I, I still am. And, uh, this is in Newark? In Newark, So yes. that would have been his, Senate, his New Jersey Senate office? Uh, in all likelihood? Yes, yes, yeah. sure, mm -hmm. sure it was. Uh, and uh, this gal, the, his, his, uh, his counsel, who was I'm embarrassed. I'm still blanking on her name. Uh, she she recruited me, and I became quite active in his senatorial uh, campaign committee stuff. Uh, I had some re relationships in Oklahoma and Colorado that m mobilized in his behalf, I mean, on behalf of that cause, and uh, so that it. it a, a friendly relationship evolved. Uh, uh, and when he, when it came time for him to run for governor, uh, for no good reason, but it was useful for them, I was denominated treasurer of the campaign, uh, which meant I had to go to treasurer school at the FE, and, E like it. Education. Yeah, right, yeah, Election Law Enforcement Commission. Uh, and that was about four hours. It was sort of interesting. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I, my functioning as treasurer was there was a lot of good staff work going on. All I had to do was review the quarterly, the oh, monthly okay. reports <laughs> and, and help raise money, which I was delighted to do. I mean, I, th I, thought, I thought John you know, would, be, would be a very interesting governor. Uh, and little did I know he was going to have an automobile accident that was going to take out the core of core time of his, of his anyhow. Was it, did you serve in any on any of the boards or commissions during his um, uh, governorship? Or well, I will tell you, here, now here here is a truthful story. Uh, the, the, I had gotten a message that what would you like to do, man? And I said, you know what I'd really like to do is be a commissioner of the port authority because my dear friend Alan Sagner had been chair, my, my by then um, undiluted friend <laughs> Vic Leone had been chair. It was clear to me that that was a, an important place to be. Uh, and then John and I were together at some function, he pulled me aside and he said, Len, I know you won't be on the Port Authority, um, but I, I, I can't appoint you, I, got, I have to appoint a woman. This was after I'd been vetted. I mean, Tony Kosha had mm -hmm. spent four hours with me uh, 
not overtly vetting, but that was manifestly what was happening. So John's like, I got to appoint a woman. Now, at this point, my memory is not clear. Either I said, or later thought I should have said, would a sex change operation make a <laughs> difference? Uh, I, I really, I'd like to think I said it, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so that was as close as I came. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as the news started breaking over the last several months, I was grateful for, for my failure <laughs> to get on, get on that, get that job. Well, I, except I mean, what a fascinating place to be, right? I mean, I, I yeah, uh, as 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 difficult as a time as it is clearly going through right now. Part of the reason that it's such an interesting place is because of the of the machinations between the two states. Yeah, or, yeah. You know, what's but I developed mean, as, it was, yeah. anyhow, I'm glad I didn't have to face yeah, it. Yeah, I can understand that. Uh, I, I had, it's funny, I, I, while I'm being garrulous for a change, uh, I had aspired to be on the board of Mutual Benefit Life Insurance Company. Uh, and shortly before the, whatever, the, the, the equivalent of their bankruptcy happened, uh, was it? I mean, the state took him over for insolvency problems. You, you, you're yeah. looking baffled. Mm, mutual, yeah. ben mutual benefit. I know it's out of business, but I didn't realize. Yeah, no, they, it was, they were in bad financial trouble. Mm. And uh, I got the, the word came back to me that you can't come on our board because we you're not a sitting CEO anymore. Uh, and they. So they, instead of me, they took my friend Josh Weston, who was still a sitting CEO. But very soon after that, the mutual benefit hit its problems, and that board it spent the next several years defending itself in various litigations as to why they hadn't foreseen and dealt, uh, dealt with the issues. Whatever. And was there personal liability of directors well, as well? The, there would have been had had. Had, uh, at the end, nobody paid anything, but they spent a lot of time in depositions. And uh, it was. Uh, See, sometimes I, you need to be careful of what you wish for. Well, that's right. That was. An, that was. A, it's, it's two two events. I ain't wishing for nothing anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> a little survival. Well, the, well, we're wishing you every success. Well, I appreciate um, it. And and um, thanks very much for for being here today and giving us the benefit of your well, wisdom and years of experience.